Good morning. No, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope you have had a good morning so far. Welcome to lecture four of Comp 1511. Um, it is very exciting to be here in week two. We're, it's, it's hump day. We're, we're halfway through week two. It's amazing how quick things are going. So today in the chat, we have the lovely Mai. And we will also have Shrey joining us in about 10 minutes. And um, Shrey, it is actually his birthday today. So he's um, uh, he loves 1511 so much that he's choosing to spend two hours of his birthday manning the chat and um, chatting with all of you. So please wish Shrey a happy birthday once he joins the chat in about 10 minutes. Um, so today we are going to talk about loops and also I wanted to say thank you to everyone who has left um, feedback on the lecture yesterday. I will provide uh, a link to leave some feedback today. Um, I have already made some changes so hopefully we'll see if those changes are working well. So the changes are someone has told me <laughs> to turn my mic around. Um, so it's properly uh, so it's properly placed, which I have done. I really hate the microphone in my face, which is why I tried to move it away from myself before. Um, and also today, when I'm coding, I will be using uh, two different screens for my code and also for my terminal window. Um, and that is because um, you can't really see my code properly. So someone said, "Oh my gosh, it looks really messy." which is a great thing to notice and something we will talk about next week as well, what happens when we see this terrible um, messy code. Ah, lots of happy birthday messages. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Um, and yeah, we should tell him to scroll up so he can see what's happening. Um, and we can do, I mean, someone, I mean, I could sing, look at this microphone. It's, it's the whole vibe here is for this microphone to sing, but I'm not very good at singing, so I'm not going to sing. Um, I wish someone who's better at singing could do this for me, but unfortunately there's no one at my house except for dogs. Um, excellent. All right. Well, let's get started on our uh, loops. How exciting. All right. So yesterday we uh, had a little bit of discussion and yesterday we talked about... Um, feel like I can see something behind. Oh no, it's the microphone. This is why I hate this microphone. Sorry. Okay. Back to not, I'm not going to pay attention to this microphone in front of my face. Um, so uh, yesterday we talked about if statements. We saw some more complex if statements in motion. We tried to apply some logical operators as well to them. Uh, we chained some ifs and some else's. Um, we broke stuff, which was awesome. And then we looked at some structures and creating structures. So it's been fantastic. Um, okay, so today we are gonna, we're gonna loop, we're gonna go on and on and on and on. I always think whenever I do looping in any programming language, and obviously looping is, it's a simple concept, well not really that simple a concept, but it's a concept that's applicable in any programming language. And I don't know, whenever I think of looping, I always think of roller coasters. I love roller coasters. So that's, um, I just think, you know, you go around in a loop, you might go around again. You might go around in a smaller loop within a bigger loop and you might just, oh, I do have quite a few looping jokes. If anyone has any, please share. But I don't want to, oh, I really don't want to hurt you all with my lame dad jokes. Um, but I will try and not do looping jokes, but I will. I will. I'm sorry. Um, someone has a, Brian, I see your burning question. Uh, a Boolean is a data type, but we do not do it in 1511. So we do not cover it in 1511. We learn different ways to do things. Okay. Today's code will be on this beautiful web page uh, on, in our week two section. I have made all the files available and that means that you will be ready to follow along once we start coding, which will be in um, not that long at all. Um, in fact, I think, no, in another slide. Okay, so when do we loop? What on earth is looping? 
Looping is when you need to keep doing something over and over again until something happens. And you might not know, not know how many times you will need to do something in advance. So you, either you will know the number of times you need to go around in a loop or you will not know how many times you will need to go in a, around in a loop. And there's different combinations of ways that we can set that condition in our loop. So what are some examples? Can you guys think of any examples in real life when we loop and loop and loop and loop? So I thought of one when whilst there are songs in my playlist, I will keep playing the songs. Once there's no more songs, I will stop. Um, can anyone think of any other while loops uh, or just loops? Can anyone think of something that happens in a loop in real life? Checking the fridge, that's a really good one. Arguments, so true, you often have the same argument. Um, traffic lights, yes, that's a really good one. Um, kids in the car asking, are we there yet? Yes, so true. Living through lockdown, especially if you're in Melbourne, you're on round eight, I think. Are you on round six? It feels like round forever. Uh, looping the same food I eat each day, loop of musical instruments, breathing. Yes, breathing is an excellent one as well. Um, well, <laughs> well, there is COVID spread to nearby people. <laughs> bit dark, but I like it. Okay. Uh, exam, my life. Um, someone said, once I graduate, I'll stop doing uni work and assignments. I mean, that's a nice loop, but then you'll just have to be doing other work at night. It's that's a, just a never ending loop. Now. Um, I think it's just a lot more fun to be a kid. Uh, while there are cookies in front of me, I will eat them. I like it. Um, uh, lots of, <laughs> lots of really great loops. Love it. Uh, yeah, Melbourne did have an earthquake this morning and apparently lots of people in Sydney felt it as well. Um, some of, um, one of our tutorials felt it apparently, quite a few people did. Um, yeah. Never ending loop of scrolling through TikTok. Absolutely, that's just an infinite loop um, every evening. Ah, oh, some really, really great loops well done uh, well not unhealthy thinking i hope i hope you can do some healthy thinking break that loop with some healthy thinking instead but some really good examples you know that show that you really uh understand what a loop is and how to go around in a loop um circle 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 so c normally executes code in order as we've said so you go from top to bottom you go line by line you enter the code in the main function and then you execute the code uh, one by one by one by one um, if you use an if statement it allows you to turn or turn oh i think shrey has joined the chat just hello what do we want to say to shrey oh there's a little lag <laughs> <laughs> Thank you in advance to everybody. I appreciate all the nice messages I was reading up a little bit before. Oh, very good. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. There we go. Quick lecture interruption for a happy birthday to Shrey. <laughs> See, that was a loop that we did. We wished Shrey a happy birthday until there was no more. And then when Shrey entered the building again, we did a loop again to wish him another lot of happy birthdays. So here's another example of loops in real life. It's all just a teaching moment. It's all a teaching moment. Ah, lovely. Thank you, everyone. I did, everyone. I did say that I might sing you a happy birthday, Shrey, but I don't want to ruin your birthday. <laughs> all right, team, let's get back to our loops. Ah, oh, someone is doing amazing cakes as well and emojis. Ah, oh, Shrey, all the love, amazing. This is all the love that you need in lockdown on a lockdown yeah. birthday. <laughs> so a lot of demands for singing. I mean, it's on YouTube forever. I'm not sure I'm willing to go that far. <laughs> hey, it could be a new career, you never know. Yeah, no, if you've heard me sing, I did. that will definitely not be a career I can ever start. All right, fantastic. Oh, thanks everyone. We've got such a lovely bunch of students. Okay. 
So when we look at our C code, if statements allow us to turn on and off parts of our code, so we kind of um, can use an if statement to branch out and perform a certain section of code if a condition has been met. But up until now, we haven't really had um, a way to repeat our code. So a while loop allows us to repeat our code and you have to be, uh, you know, you have to be very, you know, short of sort of pasting, copying and pasting chunks of code again and again and again and again, which will create very, very messy code. You don't want to do that. So a while loop uh, or a loop allows us to be able to um, control how many times we repeat something and we can, you know, repeat something as many times as we need to. Um, even when we don't know how many times there is, perhaps um, something else will happen and then that's when we'll stop, which we will talk about more later. Um, otherwise, I sound like I'm talking in riddles. Um, but what it allows us to do is it allows us to repeat chunks of code um, in a really efficient way. So you have to be uh, kind of very careful because it's also very easy to create an infinite loop. Has anyone ever heard of an infinite loop? except for their dress of Apple. So let, let us know in the chat if you've heard of infinite loops. Um, so a while loop, it there is three different types that you can create of while loops. But whatever the type of while loop that you're creating, it doesn't actually matter because a while loop um, has three main things that you need to do. Okay, so there's the three main things are um, first of all, you will have, let me just go to the next slide because it's got, okay, we initialize a loop control variable. So what are we using to decide whether or not we're going to enter this while loop and exit this while loop? So we have some sort of uh, loop control variable that we're going to use and we use that before our while expression. Then in, when we open our while statement or when we open our loop, we're going to test the loop control variable. Okay, so it's going to be done within this expression bit here. We're going to test what's going on. And then number three, as usually the last statement in the while loop, what we're going to do is we're going to update the loop control variable. And the reason for that is if we do not update the loop control variable, so if we don't change it ever, we're going to enter an infinite loop, which is, you know, um, sometimes fun. Sometimes it crushes a computer. Um, I was keen to show you guys an infinite loop on my computer but my computer sort of it's really feeling no love and it's on its last legs and i'm worried and i'm going to crash the whole thing dangerous dangerous idea with your yeah. computer yeah 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 i think you can sort of hear the fan going so uh, it's not going to happen maybe uh maybe i could do it one time right at the end of a lecture because i'm going to crash out of the lecture when i create an infinite loop Okay, so there's three ways that we can control our while loop, okay? We can either do it uh, through a counter, so a count loop, so that means we know how many times we need to do something and we count how many times we're doing it. Uh, we can have a sentinel loop, and we'll talk in a second about what a sentinel is. Um, sentinel is basically a, like a flag. It's a value that's either true or false in a way. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be true or false, but it's kind of easier to sometimes think of it. It's either on or off. It's either true or false. So it sort of takes two values and we're going to do something until the value is switched to the other value. And we will look at how to use it in a second and what kind of problems we use it in. And there's also a conditional loop, which means that you will perform that while loop while some sort of condition is true. Um, and then you can, you know, exit out of it when that condition is false. And again, we're about to go over to our code um, and see it all happen in action. All right, let me switch over to our code and we're going to uh, see it all happen in action. Okay, so I'm also trying uh, as part of the feedback from the lectures, I'm trying to have my code in one window so that it looks a lot neater. And my terminal window is going to be in another window that I'll go to up here. So that, that means you will be able to sort of, you know, see what I'm doing. Um, okay, so let's do it. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is our count. So while count dot C. That's going to be the first piece of code I would like to look at. That is probably the simplest loop to do, um, the counting loop. And um, 
we'll talk about doing a, an infinite loop in a second. But um, so a count loop is really the simplest way to do it. When you're using a count loop, what you're doing is you're counting how many times you're running the loop. Now, what that means is that you know how many times you need to run the loop. And each time the loop is run, you count, I've done it once, okay, and then I've done it twice, and then I've done it three times, up until, you know, that's it kind of thing. You've, you've done it the number of times that you want to do it. Um, so let's have a look. So using a while loop allows us to repeat certain pieces of code, which is what we're doing. And remember, we've got three steps in a while loop. So we've got our initialized loop control variable. So we've got some sort of variable that we use at the start. Um, and then, yeah, Jess, it is the count plus plus thing. Although I'm not going to do count plus plus today. I will talk about plus plus uh, in front of the word and plus plus behind the word. I will talk more about it next week. Um, and I'll show you what it, what it actually equals out to today. I'm going to do it from, from sort of from scratch. Then we test the condition against the loop control variable and then we update the loop control variable um, as the last statement in the while loop. Okay, so let's have a look at some code. Let's have, let's have a problem that we can work with. So the problem is uh, I want to enter five lots of scores and I want to add them together. Uh, and then, uh, you know, oh, that should say five. Sorry, I had it as 10 yesterday when I was doing this piece of code but um, 10 got very tedious to enter into the, um, into the system, so I switched it to five. Okay, so we want to do something five times. We want to enter in five numbers that keep getting added to some sort of sum. So straight away, what I know that I need to do is I need to be able to count. So what I'm doing is I'm setting this control variable. This is going to be my counter. Okay, so what I've done is I've declared an int called count and I've set it to zero. So I'm going to start counting at zero. Um, so I've done the first part of my while loop and then I'm going to just print out uh, what my while loop looks like. So I've got some sort of while loop. I'll have some sort of condition in here and then I need to increase or decrease my loop control variable. I need to modify it in some way. So I can do a lot of things to update it, not just uh, increase or decrease. So it could be plusing, it could be minusing, it could be multiplying, depending what the problem is. In this case, I'm counting from 0 to 5. Um, so I want to be able to increase it by 1 each time to say that I have gone up 1. So what I will do is I will add 1 to my count. So if my count was 0, I'll add 1 to it. And then I'll assign this new value of what it takes back into the variable count. So remember that in C, when you use that one equals sign, you calculate what's going on on the right hand side first, and then you assign it to the left hand side. So it's not the usual way that we're used to seeing it in maths. It's not what that means. It just means you calculate out here on the right first, and then you assign it to the left. Okay, so we need to repeat something five times, which is super exciting. I don't know. I don't know. Five times, maybe, maybe not. Um, yeah, some people are asking great questions. You can do plus equals in C and we will uh, look at it next week. So you can do that. Absolutely. So what's going to be our condition if we need to count five times and we're keeping track with our counter? What do you guys reckon? What do you reckon? What's going to be our condition? Take a guess. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So someone, there's a few ideas. Okay. So our count has to be less than five. Now someone has also said less than or equal to five. Okay. So what's, what happens in this case? If it is less than or equal to 5, that means it's going to include the number 5 in its count. So it's going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's actually going to go around 6 times if I include the 5 because I've started counting at 0. 
So this is something that we have to be a little bit uh, careful about when we're doing our while loops. But this is a mistake that's often quite easy to spot as well, how many times you've gone around the loop. And usually if you've gone one extra or one not enough, it means you either have an equal sign or you don't have an equal sign, depending on the problem. So because I've started counting at zero, I'm not going to have an equal sign. If I had start, started counting at one, then I would have had an equal sign because then it would have been one, two, three, four, five. So it would have been five times around. So the zero will count as the first lot because I haven't changed it until the end of the while loop. So when I go inside this while loop over here, the first time it's going to say, is zero less than five? Yes, it is. So I'm going to go inside this while loop. So, and then you will do some sort of code that is in here. Okay. So someone's saying, is the condition always an N minus one? It's not always. It depends on how, it depends on what the problem is and what you start counting at. Sometimes it is more intuitive to start counting at one than at zero, in which case you might have an equals to there as well. So it depends on what the problem is and how you are solving that problem. So it's not necessarily always going to be N minus one, but for a lot of cases it will be because for some reason we always start counting at zero. Well, not for some reason. I mean, zero is probably where you usually start counting. So, okay. So what, what are we trying to do? We want to be able to enter five lots of scores in and we want to keep adding them together. So there's a few things that we need as well, okay? So we're gonna be doing some adding, we're gonna be doing, okay, so let's have a look, what do we need to do? We need to enter, enter a score. We need to be able to add the score to a sum. Okay, and that's about it, okay. So I need to be able to enter the score and I need to be able to add to the score, which means I need a variable to hold this score and also I need some sort of variable to hold my sum as well, okay? So I'm gonna need two more variables and I'm going to say I'm going to have int score as my variable that's going to hold my score and I'm going to have int sum as a variable that holds my sum, okay? So note again that I've given them variable names which are exactly what's going on. So when someone is reading through this code, it kind of kind of implies what the problem is already. Okay, so how will we enter a score? We probably should ask the user for a score. And then after that, we probably need to scan something in off the terminal to be able to see what they've actually said. So let's prompt the user for a score. So we'll print F. Um, enter a score and then I'm going to scan this score in. And don't forget ampersand score, I'm going to store it in my variable score and now that means I have a score. I want to add that score now to my sum. So I'm going to say that sum is going to be equal to whatever it was plus the score. Okay, and then maybe just so that we know what's going on and there is a mistake in this code, we'll see if anyone can pick it up in a second. So you have gone around the loop however many times, just so that you can see how many times we have gone and the sum is now percent %d. Now I'm going to remember the new line this time so I don't get annoyed and you guys don't have to listen to me rant about new lines. Okay, there is, ah, oh, someone's picked it in the chat. Well done. Well done, Lisa. We absolutely need to initialize the sum. And the reason for that is right now I've declared this variable called sum. Sum has no value and a few other people have picked it as well. Fantastic. Well done, guys. So when it gets over here and it says sum plus score, when it tries to figure it out, we're going to go, um, actually, this is nothing. So I can't really add something to nothing. 
Um, not zero as in there's just nothing there. So you don't know what it is. It's an uninitialized variable. So what it means is we really need to initialize it as well as declare it so that the first time it's accessed, it's going to have a value of zero. So we start with zero. Yep. So let me demonstrate this error as well, right? Good idea. Let me demonstrate it so that you can see what it does. So let's go to terminal and let's compile our program. Okay, so over here we have uh, a warning. Some may be used uninitialized in this function, uninitialized, uninitialized, uninitialized. So when it's telling you something is not initialized, what it means is that you haven't given it an initial value, okay? So now if we set it to zero, what it will do is it will stop telling us that. It will stop being angry at us. Yeah. Well, the, James, yes, it will, but it will start counting at zero. So it's like our, a, a very unnatural way to count almost sometimes unless you start doing programming and then it becomes a ridiculously natural way to count for some reason to always start everything at zero. So I'm going to enter some scores. I'll go once and it's told me you have gone around the loop zero times. And the sum is now 1 because I've done 0 plus 1. So now I'm going to enter a score of 2. You have gone around the loop 1 times and the sum is now 3. Okay. So let's do a loop of 3. So you've initialized the score by scanning something into the score. But you don't have anything about the sum. So you've gone around the loop 2 times. The sum is now 6. And if we go again, we've gone around the loop three times. The sum is now 10. And I'll go again. And on this last go, because it's really looped one, two, three, four, five, it's looped five times, which is how many times I told it to loop, um, it, it, it will exit out of the program once it's finished looping. Okay. Um, so... Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, someone asked why I initialized the sum but not the score. And it's because the score was initialized over here. Once you've scanned something into the score, that's given it an initial value. Okay, I could make this score zero and then it will just be overwritten here based on what I've scanned in, what number I have. But the input is what has initialized it. However, the sum is used for the first time here without any initial value whatsoever. Okay. All right. So uh, that was using a counter to go around the loop. Okay. And we've gone around five times. You could go around as many times as you want. So now someone said, okay, well, I mean, it looks quite ugly when you've gone around the loop zero times. I mean, what does that mean? We can't really associate that with what is happening because, you know, zero is the kind of absence of numbers, I suppose. So if we start our counting at one now, we want to go around the loop five times. That means we're going to include the five now. So we're going to have an equals. So count has to be less than or equals to five. And now if we run it, our counting will start at one. So one, and now it says you've gone around the loop one times. The sum is now one and two times, three times, four times and five times. So now this feels a lot better you know, aesthetically and, and in the context of what we're doing. And so it depends what the problem is asking you, where you, you will start counting. And then you just have to be very careful about what your condition is, that it either includes the number of times you have to do it or it doesn't include it, depending again what you're trying to do. But you can always go through what you, the code that you have written, okay? So on the first run, if I have the sum as one, when it goes into this loop, it says, is 1 less than 5? Yes, so I'm going to go in here. Whatever score will be entered in here, it will now add it to the sum. And here, count will increase. So my count was initially 1. So then it will do 1 plus 1, which is equal to 2. So then when it goes back up here, it's going to ask, is 2 less than 5? Yes, that's true. So I'm going to go in again and so on and so forth. And you're going to keep going in 
until this count over here will be equal to, on the fifth go, it's going to be equal to six. And when you go into this while loop and you say, okay, is six less than five? No, it's not, which means that you break out of this while loop, okay? You are free to leave it and then you can go out and you can return, you know, you can finish the program. Okay, so let's have a look at Okay, so someone's saying can you change the order of printf and count? So you can change the order up, but I always find that it's easiest to finish there's there's a lot of different ways to do it and and a lot of it has to do with also how you style your code. And I always think that uh, saying increasing or decreasing or changing the counter as the last thing inside the while loop is the easiest way to remember what happens because then this change and me incrementing or decrementing the counter is not lost somewhere in the middle of my code. I can clearly see how I'm changing the loop control variable and so if I'm looking at someone else's code that means I can see how they are changing their loop control or how they're controlling it. So the model that I'm trying to create of this while loop would have that, uh, that statement at the end because of that in particular. Um, okay, uh, this is called a count loop because you're counting through and you know how many times you will count through it. What would happen if this line was placed at the top of the while loop? That is a great question, Brendan. Um, and what you will get is you will get a, a bit of a mess, actually. If you are placing this line at the top, so if I say this is going to be my first line when I enter in, okay, count is equal to count plus one. What will happen is you're going to get something that looks like this. On the first entrance of this while loop, okay, it's the count is set to one. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say, is one less than five? Yes, it is. I'm going to go in here. Okay. Now it wants me to change my count. So now count is going to be one plus one. It's going to be equal to two. Okay. And then I'm going to enter a score, do the sum. I'm going to print out and then I'm going to go back here again. Okay. And now my count is set to two already. So I'm going to compare is two less than five. Yes, it is. So I'm going to go back in here again and I'm going to add the count. I'm going to change it up. So now the count is three and I'm going to go through again and how exciting I'm now back here. How many times have I run through it now? Twice. Okay. It might be easier to also run the code. So you see what I'm doing? Um, let me run the code for you to show you exactly what it does because, or I should just do it less times so that you don't get sick of me looping so many times. Okay. So now if I enter around, as you can see, I've gone around the loop two times, but only because that uh, statement is at the printf statement is at the end. Okay, so what's happened in this case? In this case, I mean, nothing has really happened. Okay, it hasn't broken what I'm doing. I'm still going around five times. The printf statement is in the wrong place. However, okay, there, there are problems in which incrementing your counter before before you start doing anything is going to really affect what happens inside the code. Okay. So a good way to do it is to do it at the end as like the last thing you do before you uh, move into the next loop of the while. And I will try and find a problem where it's causing a problem and then we can talk about that. Okay. Let's talk about sentinel loops now. Someone's, uh, I think Shreya Mai will answer why your code worked perfectly when you forgot to put a return zero. It, um, yeah, it will happen. Not in every case, but it will happen. You don't always have to return something. Yeah, it's complicated. Um, it, it is, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a complicated answer. Um, just quickly, I want to point out there was a, a good question of, a way, way back above that got um, dropped, um, which is that, is it preferable to do count less than five or count less than or equal to four? I think the answer to this is, is typically yes, you always want to do the, the less than version, typically. So if you're trying to iterate, if you're trying to loop from like one to some number, you usually always do um, 
Oh, sirens. You usually always do uh, while uh, your counter is less than that number. Um, we always want to try and start from zero when we can. Um, and this is the habit that you should really start getting into if you can, because it will make ladder parts of the course a lot easier, especially when you get to more complex uh, looping. Um, so try getting into the habit of starting from zero. Um, don't uh, use starting at one and equals, uh, if you can avoid it, if that makes sense. I think Sasha and touched on this a little bit as well. Yeah, and also if you do less than or equal to four, um, the problem becomes is that that code is now harder to read because when I'm reading it, just quickly reading it, I will assume that you're going around the loop four times potentially um, as opposed yeah. to five. So it's about readability of that code as well. We really want to be able to tell a story with our code. You know, we're storytellers. The idea is that like somebody who doesn't know programming should be able to scan your code and figure out what it's doing, right? Uh, if you have wild count less than five, they can sort of figure out, all right, well, this is five times. This is doing something five times. Um, that's a really good rule of thumb to stick to. A good rule of thumb to stick to is that can somebody who doesn't know programming as well as I read my code and understand what I'm trying to do? Yeah. Thank you, Shrey. All right, let's have a look at Sentinels. Okay, so I think a few people... Um, Um, I think a few people said that they are aware of what a sentinel value is. Um, but basically a sentinel value is a, a value, it's like an, a flag value is what it's called in coding. What it really means, you know, it flags when a loop can stop or when it can keep going. And it's got like a, it's like an on off switch. So it's got either, you know, something is either true or something is either false or something's either happening or it's not happening. And you use those two possibilities to control the loop. So there is a number of ways to do it. So let's have a look. So again, but whatever loop you're using, it doesn't matter. The, the model of the loop is exactly the same. You initialize the loop control variable, no matter if it's a sentinel, no matter if it's a counter, no matter if it's a condition. And then you test for it and then you update it. So... Let's say we now have a new problem so that, you know, it lends itself better to scanning for something else, okay? <clears throat> and the problem is you're now going to read some of these scores until a negative number has been entered, okay? And you want to only add the even scores up. I think I added, like, another three things to this problem um, because I wanted to show two things. So let's, let's break it down a little bit so it doesn't um, hurt our eyes so much. So again, we've got a few things happening here. Uh, we want to read in some scores. Um, and we're going to we're going to read in some scores and here we're going to stop reading when a negative number has been read. Okay, then we're going to we want to only add them add the even scores up. Okay, that means that we need to check, okay? So if we're only adding the even ones, then we need to here uh, check if the entered score is an even number, okay? If it is, add it to the sum. And if it's not, just ignore, yeah? Okay, so let's have a look. So first of all, we're still going to have a while loop. So let's create a little while loop. Now, in this type of problem, we're going to keep reading, keep reading, keep reading, keep reading until a negative number has been read. So that's really my flag. Either I've read in a positive number, which means everything is fine and dandy and I can keep going, or I've read in a negative number and then I want to exit this loop, okay? That was, sorry, that was very aggressive. I'm not really sure why I got so excited about exiting the loop. Okay, so let's have a variable that we're gonna use as a sentinel value. Okay, so I'm gonna have an int, and let's say it's going to be an end, end loop flag, and I'm going to set that to zero, okay? So I'm going to flag when I want to end the loop, okay? So when I've set it to zero, I'm saying uh, don't end it. I'm going to end it when, you know, it's set to one. So two possibilities, but I mean, the thing is I'm choosing to use the number zero and one 
You could choose any numbers at all because you're the one that controls it, okay? I just think zero and one is easier to understand. And also zero and one then ties in with, you know, when you return zero, zero is success. When you return one, one is, you know, finish, you know, something has happened. So I use zero to represent that sort of success, one to represent uh, success has finished. No more success. Um, so in my while loop then, so first thing I've done is I have um, set my loop control variable. And now I'm going to check against it, check the condition with that variable. So on the first run of the loop, I'm going to assume that I want it to be, that, that it's successful, right? That Because I want to be able to enter the while loop to start with to test anything at all. So my condition is going to be, so whilst this is equal to zero, which is exactly what it is here, I've assigned a zero to this flag. And I'm testing whether or not it's equal to zero. Remember again, two equal signs is uh, equivalence, so I'm comparing these two, so is end loop flag equal to zero, and if it is, then I'm going to go inside this loop. Now, at some stage of this loop, I'm going to have to stop, and I'm going to have to change, update the loop control variable, okay? So let's have a look what we need to do. So we need to read in some scores, so let's, let's read in some scores. Uh, let's print a prompt for the user and the prompt is going to be please enter a score to add to the sum and then let's do and we haven't even talked about breaking our scan f we all remember from last week you can break the scan f but we haven't I'm going to ignore that for the time being just to focus on loops so then we'll have our scan f we're going to read in a, uh, a number and oh I've got nowhere to store that number. I kind of need somewhere to store this lovely value that I'm reading in. So again, I know that I need a variable for a score. So now that I have a variable for a score, I have somewhere to store what I have read in. Okay. Okay. So now I have a variable that I might be able to do something with. Now I want to add the even scores up, which means that I really want to check if that entered score is an even number or not, okay? So if I've entered this score, now I need to make a decision. I'm going to ask a question. Is this score an even number? Now, anytime I ask a question, that is usually a great contender to have a little if statement going there, okay? So let's, let's check, let's check if it is. So if my score that I've entered, and it really helps to spell it correctly, if it is an even number, and we're about to go back to check for something else, so just, I'm just gonna do this part first. Okay, if it is an even number, then I wanna add it to my sum. Okay, I don't have a variable for sum. Now, if you've noticed, when I'm creating these variables, I am heading outside of my while loop to create them, okay? Um, so why am, I create, why am I heading outside and I'm not doing it in here? Why didn't I just say, oh, in sum is equal to something, something, okay? Why am I doing that? Does anyone know? So... In C, what happens is that if I have an in sum in here and I've declared it in here, as soon as I get to this close bracket, that in sum is not going to exist, okay? So someone has answered it, Clinton, yep. I am creating it at the top of my main function so that it can be used in the whole main block of code, wherever I go, okay? So... That means I can use it wherever I want and not worry that it doesn't actually exist anymore. So if my score is even, and I find that out by using the modulus um, symbol, so if you remember, that means remainder, and to determine if something is an even number, I divide it by two. If there is no remainder, then it must be even, 
and if there is a remainder then it's not even. So this is what I'm testing for here. I'm dividing whatever number was entered by 2 and asking for the remainder. So the result of this operation here will be the remainder. And then I'm checking that that remainder is equal to 0. Because if it is, then it divided into that number beautifully. And what that means is it is even and I can go through and actually add it to the sum. Okay, so that's great. So now I've, I've done that. Uh, I still don't really have a way to exit my loop. Um, so I really need to be able to consider how, where, where are we going to update this loop variable. So one thing that I haven't done here, so I've read in some scores and then I skipped over this part because I really should have made it an extra step and I missed it when I didn't see it. That should really be step two before I do anything else. Okay. So I have to stop reading when a negative number has been read. Okay. So I read in some scores and I will stop reading when they're negative. Yeah, so Lisa has got it. So the first thing I should do is I should check is this number, is this number, is this number that I have read in positive or negative? Okay, so let's check. So if I do that, I'm going to say is the score greater than zero? Okay, if it is greater than zero, then I'm going to do a whole bunch of things because it means that um, everything is dandy. Oh, no, that's very naughty to do that. Everything is dandy, and what that means is that I can, I can, you know, proceed. But if it's negative, I need to be able to stop, okay? So what that means is that I'm going to have an else here. So either my number is positive and I do a whole bunch of things, or my number is negative. If it's negative, I need to stop reading, which means that this is my opportunity to send my end loop flag to one. So I have set it to now something different, which means I will not re-enter this while loop again, okay? Now this if statement doesn't have an else uh, because it doesn't really, I don't do anything else if it's not, I don't add them in, I don't really care what you do if the number is, I just swallow up the number and move on, okay? What I care about is the number is positive, then I will do this and add it to the sum. If the number is negative, then I need to stop and get out of this loop. Okay, so what have we got? What have we got here? Let me just delete some of this space so it looks a bit neater. So why don't we try it? Why don't we try it and see what's going on? <gasps> yes, someone. Oh my gosh, yes. Thank you for picking it. Yes, we don't like zero. I, I, I get very upset with zeros. That should really be if score is greater than or equal to zero because it's really a positive number. Um, so someone's asked about break. Um, we do not use break in, um, in this course, okay? Please refrain from using breaks. Um, you use them a lot, uh, you know, in, in debugging code, but you really shouldn't be using them if you code nicely in C because um, a break interrupts your loop suddenly. You don't know what's happened. It's not a good way to control a while loop. Okay, so let's have a look. Uh, let's let's run the code. Okay, let's. I thought it compiled without any problems. How amazing! Okay, so let's have a look. I'm going to enter in a. 1, I'm going to enter in a 2, so that's going to add to the sum, and I'm going to enter in a 4, That's good. so it should give me 6 right now, okay? Ah, oh, I forgot to print out the results, so it wasn't quite so good. I thought I've done it, I've done it first go, don't have to go back to this piece of code, but I forgot to actually do anything with what I've just done, um, so you guys don't actually get to see what on earth is happening. So let's, let's tidy it up with some printf statements so we can actually see what's happening. Okay, 
So uh, let's see. So we've entered a score. Um, we've done a new sum. So let's let's printf out here so we can see that something has printed. And you can use printf statements all through your code, okay, to to help you like see where you're at or or what value a, a variable takes at any point in the code. So that helps us to really see what's going on. You know the um, the black box of what's happening in your code, I suppose. Um, so let's have a look. So um, so let's do the sum of the, and I'll put a new line, and we'll print out sum here. And then at the end, I think we'll print out the final sum. So after we exit this loop, let's print out the final sum as well. A new line, and we're using the variable sum. Okay, let's have a look. Let's go back to compiling it. I'll just clear this out so that we can see the screen better. Compile it again and run it again. Okay, if I add one, it hasn't done anything. If I add two, it's added it on. If I add three, hasn't done anything. If I add four, it's added it on. Okay, if I add seven now, and now if I finish with a negative number, it's going to exit out and the sum is going to be six, which is two plus four. Those were my two even numbers. And those are the ones that it added up. So that's exactly what I wanted to do for me. Yeah. So uh, that's really kind of how we've just used that sort of flag to be able to say, okay, should we do this? Should we not? Um, and I've used the number zero and one to set the flag to certain values. Okay, so what we'll do now is I think now is a really good opportunity uh, to have a little break. Um, and then if we come back in about five, six minutes, and then we can continue, we can see the last while loops, and then we can, um, and then we can, you know, yeah, we can do some more problems and we can see where we're at. So if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and, uh, you know, we can answer them as, as we go.
All right, we're back. Um, I've been loving watching your solutions. The person that has just abandoned the bikes and bought a plane ticket, that's not really going to work that well for you right now in lockdown because all the flights are getting cancelled all the time. So I'm sorry, that is not the solution. Someone did get the solution uh, where you, a few people got the solution where you drive them 50 kilometers, um, you know, and then siphon some petrol out, put it in the other bikes. So then you've got 25 bucks and you can, you know, keep going a little bit longer and stuff. So I love it. But there were some very, very creative solutions, which have been awesome to see. Um, love it. Um, <laughs> someone's just blowing things up. Why not? Um, yeah. So well done, guys. Love it. Okay, let's go back to our lovely... Oh, here we go. I've appeared as well. Okay, let's go back to the lovely while loop. And it looks like lots of people are attending the lecture while still comfortably in bed. So that's quite nice. Um, I'm very excited. I wish I was still in bed as well. Okay, uh, let's have a look. Okay, we're going to do a conditional while loop now, okay? How exciting, you know, just while loops coming out of your wazoos. So let's have a look. So again, a conditional while loop is exactly the same, except that you're using a condition to control the while loop. So you're going to check if some condition has been met. If it is, you're going to stay in there. If it hasn't, you're going to leave it. Um, but again, any while loop you use, you always have the same three steps. You initialize the loop control variable. You test whether that condition has been, you know, met in the loop control variable in the while condition. And then you update the loop control variable as well. So it's always important to have that end to the loop so you can exit the loop as well. Because you really don't want to be stuck in an infinite loop. When it happens, it's, um, well, I mean, it can be fun, but it's, it's not pretty because your computer... If you're doing it on your local machine, your local machine will crash. Um, okay, let's have a look. So our problem this time is I want to read in some scores and keep adding them together while the sum of the scores is less than 100. Okay, so now you can see that I've kind of stated a condition here. So I've got a problem again. Well, I mean, we all have problems, I guess, but... My problem is reading in some numbers right now. So I'm going to read in some scores. I'm going to add those scores together. And I also do have apparently a spelling problem. And then what's going to happen is I'm going to keep adding. I'm going to keep adding until some of scores is less than 100. Yay, we've basically got our code just from breaking down our problem into a series of much smaller steps. So let's do our while loop to start with. Okay, so I'm just going to put in the bones of the while loop, um, which is just saying while brackets uh, and curly braces. And then we're going to have uh, a little something here that will control what's going on. Okay. So we need to read in some scores. Again, if I'm reading in some scores, that means I need to read them into something. So I'm going to have an int score variable to read the scores into. And again, I'm adding these variables together. So I'm going to have a sum as well that will keep track of what's going on. Interestingly, I keep adding until sum of scores is less than 100, which means that sum actually becomes my condition. Okay, so because, um, so this, this becomes my loop control variable. And the first time I've set it to zero. And that should say while, sorry. Okay, so we have our in sum is equal to zero. So we've set our loop control variable. Now we want to check for its condition. Now what do you guys reckon the condition will be? How will I write it? Okay. 
So I want to keep doing something while sum is less than 100. And I want to stop if that sum becomes more than 100. Yeah, yeah, lots of people getting it. Perfect, well done. Well done, guys. So while sum is less than 100, then I'm going to keep doing something, okay? Otherwise, I'm going to stop. So again, what I need to do in here is I need to read in some scores. So I'm going to print F, enter a, a score, and then I'm going to scan that score in. Place it inside score. And then what I need to do is I need to really update my, uh, you know, my loop control variable. And in this case, it's quite neat actually, because me changing the loop control variable is actually still doing whatever I need to do as well. So update the loop control variable will be me changing the sum. Okay. And I'm changing the sum by adding the next score that is being input into it. Okay. And then I've got this lovely uh, thing happening here and it should exit when the sum. So let's have a look, let's print F and we're gonna say the final sum is new line and sum is the variable that we're looking at. Okay, let's have a look. Compile success. Yes, it's always very exciting when it compiles. I mean, it might not work, but it still compiles. All right, so uh, since I'm going to less than 100, I'm just going to go up in, I don't know, bigger numbers. So we don't have to do it. Okay, so what if I do perfection, okay? So this, if I do 10 plus 40, that's 50, plus 50 again, okay? What's going to happen? The final sum's 100, and I'm going to exit out of it, yeah? Now... If I have anything that is, and someone's seeing perhaps some problems that will happen, what if I don't have a perfect, uh, what if I don't have a perfect, let's say I'm going to put in 60. So that's 120, isn't it? Okay. And so look at this. I'm going to get 120 because the sum when I got here was still less than 100. So when I got, so if I put in the numbers 20, 40, 60, what happened is here I've entered the number 20. So it scanned in 20. The sum was 20. And that means when I came here, it was 20 is less than 100. Yes, it is. So I kept going. Then I entered in 40, which means that the sum is now 60. And I came here again. And again, um, 60 was less than 100, which means that I can enter this while loop. And then on the next go, when I enter something that's like 50 or 60, then it's going to give me 60 plus 60, which is 120. So when I go the next time, I'm going to get, I'm going to break out of the loop because my sum 120 is going, is not going to be less than 100. But my final sum is more than 100 because I was able to go out through it. Yeah. So I'm going to leave you with a little bit of a, oh, this is a good little riddle. See if you can play around with this code and maybe you can place it also on the forums, on the lecture forum. Play around with it to see if you can fix it, if you can make that sum be less than 100 to exit out before that happens. So the condition, I think, and the count are probably the two easiest ones to understand. I noticed that the sentinel one was the one that people really didn't particularly love um, but you you know pending the problem you will use whichever loop you want so just remember that a sentinel is really a flag it's a way for you to to keep track of if something has happened or if something hasn't has happened so that means that what happens is that you know um, you will stop something when it's set and to a different value but 
The zero and one, they can be anything, but the zero and one is easier to understand. So often with the flags, we use the numbers zero and one. So zero, keep going, one, stop. But you might not do that. You might say, oh, actually one is keep going and zero is stop. It doesn't matter which way you do it, as long as you have one value for when you keep going and one value for when you stop, okay? And they are different values because otherwise infinite loop situation. So definitely let's, let's um, that's how that works, okay? All right, let's have a look at uh, another problem. Let's have a look at something else that uh, you know, the lovely while loops you can do with while loops. Okay, so what we've seen so far is that we can do an if inside an if inside an if inside an if inside an if, but actually that's very bad style to do it. So let's not, um, you know, let's not do that such great nesting if, but, you know, you can also nest your while loops as well. You can put a while inside a while inside a while inside a while. Um, but it's it, it can get very messy. So you've got to be very careful and think about what's actually happening. So if you put a loop inside another loop, what happens is that each time a loop runs, it runs the other loop, okay? So think about it like the clock. And this, this I don't know, this was a gift. It was meant to be moving. So think of your second hand, which moves around all the way before your minute hand ticks over one. And your minute hand has to move around all the way around the loop before the hour hand can tick over one. And it's similar with your loops as well. Whatever the loop is that is inside, it's gonna end up running a lot of times. So the inside loop will go over and over and over and over again for the outside loop to tick over one and so on. So just like a clock, we've got our second minutes and hours, it works in much the same way. So what happens is that your inside loop ends up running many times and then your outside loop, um, you know, a few less times. So let's, let's actually see this in action because I think sometimes those types of problems are the hardest to kind of get your head around and sometimes it's really useful to draw the problem out. So we're going to do a really simple problem to start with um, and then we can kind of go from there, maybe increase the difficulty by one and so on and so forth. Okay, so I really love these types of um, grids and stuff and patterns because you can really see what's going on. Um, and I've chosen to use numbers in this pattern because um, I think that way you can see which counters are working and which counters are doing something else. So let me just open up the files and then we'll go over to our, um, we'll go over to our lovely terminal and gedit. Okay, uh, let me switch over here. Okay, let's talk about a while inside a while. Um, so let's, okay, did not mean to do that. Okay, all right. So our problem in this case is we want to print out a grid of numbers that looks like this, where it goes one, two, three, four, five. And there is, so, oh my gosh, now you'll see that I have issues with rows and columns as well. But uh, row is across, column is down. Think of the structure. So we've got uh, five, five rows and five columns. So it's really, we're printing out a bit of a square, but I mean, you know, you could print out any shape and perhaps after we finish doing it like this, we might take input from the user and see how we can do it with that as well, instead of just having it a five by five. But first let's address this problem where we're doing a five by five sort of situation. Let's have a look at it um, when we're doing something like that. Okay, so what will we do here? Okay, clearly we need to break down this problem into something that we can perhaps do and then, you know, keep building it up again. So let's break down the problem until there is something that we can do. 
Okay, so could you print out one row of numbers? Yes, I think you can. I think, I think, how would you print out one row of numbers? Could you use something that we've done so far? Well done. So we're going to use a while loop with a counter and a printf. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, and someone's being very good. You can just printf 12345, new line. Printf 12345, new line. But a more efficient way to do it would be using a while loop. But yes, very clever. You could just print out the numbers 12345 and go with that. But we do not want to be um, hard coding things uh, so much. We really want to be able to leave our code flexible. But yes, absolutely, because I gave you such a um, sort of a stable question, it's always five by five, it's always the same. You could easily just print F12345, new line, print F12345, and so on and so forth. But yeah, let's use a while loop to do it. Okay, so what happens if we print out one row? So to print out one row, yeah, we will have a while loop. So now remember that when we do our while loop, we're going to need a control variable, a loop control variable first. And I'm going to count it off. So int count is equal to zero. And let's do, oh, semicolon, almost forgot a semicolon. I saw this funny meme the other day where it was like in a game of Street Fighter, who would win? And then had the character in the semicolon and the semicolon was always winning. That's how I feel. That's how I feel. Semicolons will keep you up at night. Um, okay. And then we have a while loop. So we're doing it five times, just like we did before. Okay. So yeah. And William, you've got it. A while loop inside a while loop for rows and columns. Yeah. So first let's do it for one and then we can uh, continue going. So whilst count is not greater than, whilst count is less than five, we are going to print f and we're going to print f that number and the number is going to be whatever the count has taken yeah and now very important so we've tested we've done our test here and now we need to update the loop control so this is where i'm going to increase my count Okay, so what's this going to do for us? This is going to just print out the numbers one, two, three, four, five. I like that, yeah, Daniel, I do. I feel like the semicolon, yeah, it does. It's, they're just rejoicing in the horror that is the semicolon. That's, that's how it feels sometimes. Um, okay, let's do, okay, let's see what it does. So we should be able to print just one row and it should say one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. What's going to happen? Magic is going to happen, but well done, Lisa. Yes, it's going to print out a zero first. Well done. So what I really need to do is I need to set my counter to start counting at one which means I want to do one, two, three, four, five. So that means I'm going to go until it's equal to five as well. And yes, someone has said, I did forget about the new line because I am actually going to need a new line as well in there, okay? To be able to, uh, where should the new line go? Should the new line go inside the while loop or outside the while loop? What do you guys reckon? after the while loop, outside the while loop. Well done, well done. It will absolutely have to go outside of the while loop because if I put it inside the while loop, that means it's going to keep pressing, you know, it's gonna keep going to a new line 
every single time that I print out a number. So I'm going to get one on one line, two on another, three on another, four on another, and so on and so forth. So well done. Everyone is just... Oh, thanks, Shrey. <laughs> um, Shrey's messing with you guys, but it's his birthday, so he's allowed. Okay, let's print out a new line here. Um, and we should now have a beautiful line of code that will allow us to be able to recompile and run it again. And now we have this beautiful row, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and now we need to do some columns. So that's great. We've done one part of this problem, okay? So always when you see a big problem, and I'm not saying that this is a big problem in particular, but always try and, you know, break it down into components that you can do. Okay, I've left a space here just because so that the numbers don't go clustered together. Okay, I want them to be with a little bit of space between them um, because I will get an eye twitch if they're clustered closely together. Um, so what it creates is this one space because otherwise it would be missing the space if I didn't have that space. It would look like that, which is just horrible, isn't it? Aesthetically, it just it breaks my heart. Daniel, yes, and I think William beforehand also guessed it. Absolutely. We are going to nest it, okay? And we're going to um, do an inside loop. So each inside loop, I'm going to print out one, two, three, four, five. And then on the outside, I'm going to move on to the next line. And note again that I have to, I have to start back at one, okay? And then go back. And then every time I change my row, oh my God, I hope I'm not killing you with row and column. It's a row, right? Row. Every time I change my row, I need to go back to one when I start. Okay. Okay. So let's do another while loop. Okay. So right now I've got this lovely variable name called account, okay, which if I have a grid, um, account doesn't make that much sense. I could have account one and account two, but again, those are not great variable names because they're not really what's count one and what's count two. So I really want a row and a column because that is describing what's going ac across and what's going down. So a row is going across, a column is going down. Um, thank you. I do realize row is across, column is down, but it's when I see a grid for some reason I start to go, is that a row or is that a column, which is just bizarre. Um, it fits nowhere in my head. Um, okay, so let's do rows and columns instead. Okay, so what will this inside loop be? Will the inside loop be rows or columns? Oh, I always think of giant columns and arches being built, and that's, you know, tall columns. That's fun how people think of rows and columns as well. And I, I've never realized, yeah, why rows and columns affect me so much. But they do, just rows. Okay, so we you run across the field. You do run across the field, and wouldn't we love to run across the field now if it is within five kilometers of us? Okay, so we're going to do rows here. Oh, not wars. Rows, row, and then that means here we're going to have a row as well and a row as well here and a row as well here. Okay. Okay, so that means our inside is going to be the rows and that means that on the outside we're going to have the columns. Okay. And what are we going to do inside our columns? We're going to do our lovely, lovely, what's going to be our loop condition. And you can see how I'm indenting everything over one because I'm trying to let myself see where we're at. Okay, what's going to be a condition that we're going to test for here? Yep, well done. So whilst column is less than or greater than five, which is me testing the condition. So here I've got my loop control variable here. I'm testing for it. And then what I really want to do is I want to update my loop control variable. So outside of my inner while loop, I'm going to increase this one over one. 
Yeah, so column is equal to column plus one. Okay, what do we think of this? Do we think that this is going to do it? And then I'll point it out a few things that we've done here. Let's try it out, okay. Okay, compile and let's print it out. Oh, what magic, it's done it, how amazing. I don't really need, hmm, did not mean to do that. Apologies, everyone. Okay, so uh, very nice, very nice. Okay, one thing I want you to notice here, okay, one thing I want you to keep in mind as well. In here, you saw that I created my inner while, and this is my inner while, so this is my, you know, second hand going around and around my rows. And then I created the upper while outside it, okay. So notice here that even though I've got a variable here, I put it inside inside my uh, my first while loop so I put it straight away where I'm going to use it with my loop control variable I didn't put it outside why do you think that is why do you think my row counter belongs inside the first while loop but outside the second but doesn't belong up here somewhere you know outside the first while loop what do you guys reckon Yeah, see, this is what I mean. This rows and columns, uh, you know, feel free to go columns on the other side, rows on the inside. Uh, it's, but yeah, basically someone's got it. You will need to reset each loop of the big hand. Exactly. So each time you're resetting it back to one. So each time, if you think of your second hand, it goes one, two, three, four, five, sixty, and then it goes back to one when your outside hand just moves one space. So what we're doing is each time we go five places, we're going to reset it back to one, you know, and then we're going to take our new line and then we start again with one. So you want to be able to count it again. Now, if you want to see what happens, and this is a common mistake, so let's see what happens when you don't do that, when you decide to be, um, when you forget to do that and you just do them all at the same time here. Let's have a look what happens, just so that you know what to look out for when you see it happening. In um, when you're working through things. Okay, let's have a look. Let's compile it and let's print it again. So what it will do is it will create this lovely one, two, three, four, five. It will go through the loop once and then it will be like, oh, okay. And then it's just going to do some, uh, you know, it's going to do some new lines and then it's going to exit out. And this is a really common problem. So when you see something like this where you have kind of like a, the beginnings of a grid, it usually means that you have not put your loop control variable in the right place, okay? It's not sitting right outside where you're going to use it, okay? And I'm using it in this while loop. I have to be able to reset it each time. So we want to change it back to one each time that we complete, each time that we complete a movement, each one that we go down one row. Okay, fantastic. That was great. So we've got a grid now and it's looking good. Let's, uh, let's uh, you know, let's maneuver and make it a little bit more difficult. Every time I do that, I'm sorry. Okay, let's make it a little bit more difficult. And now we're going to print out a pyramid. Okay, how fantastic um, a pyramid. So exciting. A pyramid is a bit harder to print out than a grid because a grid is, you know, the same number of, everything is happening the same number of times. It's five across and five down. Actually, should we do uh, any number as well? Should we do any number? How, would, how do you reckon you would decide what square number it is? You can ask the user out here if you want to have a variable number of rows and columns, okay? So you can actually take in, you know, enter the size of the square grid you want to print.
and then you scan in that size. So you scan if. Okay, so that means I need to scan it into something. So Okay, so let's say I'm going to do it here as the size. I've taken in the size, and now instead of using this number 5 here, which actually would have been a really good place to hash define because it wasn't changing, but I can use the word size now to do the same thing, okay? And that makes my grid a lot more flexible. What it means is that I can really specify what I want that grid to do or what size I want it to be, okay? So I've forgotten to put an ampersand here. Did anyone notice it? Did anyone pick it? Oh, no one picked it. Oh, someone did pick it. Well done. Okay, let's have a look. So good spotting and let's print it out again and let's run it. And now we can enter in how big we want our grid to be. If I want it to be seven, it's going to print a seven by seven now. If I want it to be, I don't know, 15, it's going to go crazy and print 15 by 15, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So it's all very nice. It's all happening. So good catch, everyone. Um, well done. All right, let's 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 look at the pyramid. But I just wanted to show you that, you know, the whole point is, is that we make our code flexible as well. It's able to withstand change. Um, Shrey is saying DCC is your friend. Um, DCC is your friend until it gives you hours and hours of errors, but it's still your friend because it's telling you the truth. Um, okay. Oh, Daniel, a triangle with base and height. Uh, so, yeah, a pyramid, you can do a triangle with base and height. Um, there is another way to do it. 100 is super messy. I have... Yeah, I mean, if you want to see me create something hideous, that's going to look hideous. Hideous, because it doesn't fit in my window. I don't think I can make it fit nicely. And it's just clogged up my whole terminal. <laughs> Woo! Um, amazing. I might have to clear now. So it's not giving everyone an eye twitch. All right, let's look at this pyramid. What is going on with the pyramid? Pyramid. Okay, so we have a few things happening now. Okay, so we have our row. Let's keep track of what's happening in our row and column. I always think it's the easiest. I feel like I've taken you back to high school when you start algebra. And, um, what, you know, when you do those patterns, matchsticks, feel like that will give everyone nightmares. It's kind of I'm doing the same thing here. So people are guessing quite good things. Not guessing, just figuring out how to do quite good things. Um, increase the count every row. Increase the row length for outer loop. Yes, yes, yes. So in the first row, I have one column. And there is one number of rows. In the second row, I have two columns and there is two rows. In the third row, I have three columns. There's three rows. In the fourth, And in the fifth. Okay, so let's have a look. Let's do our one loop. Okay, so let's break down this problem and do one loop. If we do the very first row, that's going to be nice. I'm just going to have one, aren't I? So let's do I know I'm going to need to do a while loop. And I'm probably going to do, need to do another while loop, but let's start with the first one and let's print it out. So let's start our row at one. And we're going to keep going until five again, or what are we going to keep going until? 
Yeah, so people for every increase of one in the row col in the row, the column value increases by one. Yeah. And we're going to see what we have to type based on that as well. Okay, so let's do our row less than Sorry, my computer's having a freak out. That's why I'm kind of gone quiet. My computer's having a field day here. Okay, so if we do row is equal to five, what does that give us? Not much right now. Should we have rows equal to five? People have rows equal to row, rows equal to Okay, let's let's have a look. We can try different things as well. Okay, so whilst row is less than or equal to five, we're going to print f percent d, and I'm going to print out the row number. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to increase my row by one. What's this going to do for us? What do you guys reckon? It's just going to print out from one to five, isn't it? But that's not what I really want, is it? I want to be printing out one in the first row. Then I want to print out two in the second row and so on and so forth. So it must mean that I also have to hold off. I must also be keeping track of something else then as well. So in the first row, I'm going to print out one. In the second row, I'm going to print out one, two and so on and so forth. So what do you reckon? So someone's saying and row missing. So I haven't taken in, I haven't asked the user for anything yet. I haven't been so kind yet. So I really need to keep track of three things now. I need to keep track of what number row I'm in because in the first row, I'm not going to print out one, two, three, four, five. I'm only going to print out one. And in the second row, I'm not going to print out one, two, three, four, five as I was doing in the grid. I'm going to print out one, two. And in the third row, again, I'm not going to print out one, two, three, four, five. I'm just going to print out one, two, three. So it becomes quite useful to then keep track of how many rows I have as well. Okay, so if I keep track of how many rows I have, um, let's say I set it to one. Now I'm going to print this out for number of rows. Okay, so if it's equal to, then I'm going to print it and then it's going to go here. So do we think that's going to work? And what's that going to give us? So let's run it and see what it will print out. That's the wrong file that I've just compiled. Okay, and let's see. Okay, so it's going to print out just the one for me, okay, which is nice. I kind of want just the one, but I want to also be able to go outside and move to the next line. So beforehand, we figured out that to go to the next line, we're going to print F a new line outside of our while loop, which is exactly what we're going to do here as well. So that will allow me to go one, and then it will move me to the next line as well, okay? 
Now, what does that mean I need to do now? I need to move across to my column as well and print out a little bit more stuff. Um, and also I'm never changing this number of rows now because I've only just got one row. So I will need to do something else. I will need to now have my columns as well that I keep track of. So let's have an int column. And let's have our while loop. Now my columns, and this is where I just, I, the rows and the columns kill. I should have chosen a different thing. I'm sorry, but the rows and it's the best way to demonstrate a while inside a while is to have. Okay, so I've got the columns running on top. Um, apologies if in your head is happening a different way. Okay, so what's this going to do? What do we reckon? I'm missing a while loop closure somewhere. I can see it. There we go. All right, do we think this is going to print out something? Yeah, so Lisa's right. I haven't increased my number of rows, which is a little bit disappointing because that means I'm always going to be stuck on row one. So I also need to increase my number of rows. And I also haven't changed my lovely columns either. I haven't changed my loop control variable for columns either. So the columns right now are going to be going forever. Should we have a look what that looks like? Why not? Let's live a little on the wild side. It's nice that I've called it two different things. Let me fix that. Okay, let's see what happens. Let's see how, um, okay. So it doesn't complain, even though I've, I've, I'm about to have a bit of a situation where I've got a lot happening. And so if you have a look, what I've done is I've created an infinite loop. It's just gonna keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going. How do I get out of this infinite loop? How do I get out of it? How do I stop it? Does anyone know? If I press control C, it will stop this infinite loop. Okay. And what's, what's happening is, um, I really, I'm not changing my columns. Okay. So that means that I'm just going to keep going always in infinity. So that's what happens when you don't, um, you know, control the loop variable. So I really need to be increasing my columns so that at some stage I'm able to exit from here and I'm able to get to columns, you know, equals to five. Oh, did my audio That's cut great. out as soon as the infinite loop started? Yeah, I was I was like, oh, it's yeah. getting close to the lecture end time, so it's okay if things start crashing. But there we go, see what happens? Hey Sasha, just real quickly, um, it's worth also looking at DTC, what it was showing us when we did an infinite loop. Um, that information can be very useful in debugging an infinite loop. Um, and you'll notice there it, it showed us yeah. what the condition it was stuck on was. It also showed us what the values of certain variables were as well. Um, so when you have big complicated programs, you can actually look at the DCC output and it says there, number of rows is equal to one, row is equal to two. And you can see that um, it's infinitely looping uh, and it's never actually incrementing your number of, your row the way you expect it to. Um, well, yeah, the condition's not being run correctly. so. Um, DC output is actually very useful, so pay attention to it. Don't just ignore it as a big error message. It's actually quite useful um, yeah. to use. Absolutely. Do not ignore the error messages. That is such good advice, um, Shrey. And, and it tells you what values it had when execution stopped, which you can use to do things. And someone said, will it quit itself? It will not quit itself. It will keep going until it runs out of memory and everything crashes and burns and explodes. That's not really what happens. But it could, maybe. Maybe if it was my computer, it definitely could um, because I'm good at just <laughs> breaking things to, to the point of death. Um, I think Shrey and I have had a conversation. I once invigilated an exam where the whole thing went down, so down, <laughs> and then a fire started. It was just magic. Okay, so let's do our columns. We need to increase our columns as well. And what you will notice, and someone has already noticed it, 
and it's very nice that they have, is that actually the column and the number of rows is going to have the same values. So really, I've got an extra variable in there that doesn't need to be there, and someone has already picked that. Um, I saw it in the chat quickly. So let's see what happens when I now try and print the pyramid. Ah, with spelling it correctly. Oh, it's still not doing the right thing. And why is it doing that? Why do you think it's just printing one, 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 one each time? What do you reckon we're doing wrong? What do we reckon is happening that is causing it to just print out one, 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 one? So if we go through it over here, it's going to say is one less than or equal to five? Yes, it is. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to say row is equal to one. Number of rows is equal to one. And here I'm going to ask is one is less than or equal to one? Yes, it is. So I'm going to go in here and that means I'm going to print out that one and I'm going to say, okay, now this is equal to two. So row is now equal to two. So that means this is no longer true. And I exit out of this while loop. I print this new line. I increase my column. So column now becomes um, equal to two as well. And number of rows also becomes equal to two. So now when I go back to here and it checks is two less than five? Yes, it is. Okay, row is one, that's great. But now this number of rows is still one, which means that I am still doing exactly the same thing. Exactly, so people have picked it, well done. It's because I've got this number of rows, it is inside my while loop, and I'm saying it again and again. So each time, even though the number of rows has increased, I'm then rewriting it and making it down to one again, which is going to you know, cause issues in my code. So that's really nice spotting, okay? And a big part of coding, you're never going to have perfect code, okay? What you're going to have is issues. It's really nice to be able to go through it and spot the issues nicely as well. So this is very important. So I really do not want to be doing that, okay? I really want to be able to increase my number of rows each time, but really it's just going to be the same thing as that column. So I can just replace it, okay, because it's going to be whilst row is less than column. And then here that means I don't really need this because it was taking the same values as column. So I don't particularly need to have an extra variable. So let's see again. Let's see what it does. Let's clear that and let's compile it and let's run it. And now we have a beautiful pyramid. Um, that has worked um, magic, you know, beautifully like a charm. And again, what we can do is we can actually ask the user for an input. So we can ask them how big do we want this thing to be, okay? So the same way as we did in the grid, we can print F and we can say uh, how big do you want the pyramid to be? These are not great prompts that I'm writing. I'm sorry, I'm on the spot. Um, and we'll get them to answer it. And then we're going to scan in something that they say to us. So let's do an in size that will tell us the size. And then we're going to pop it in here ah, with a comma. And I haven't forgotten the ampersand this time. So well done, everyone. Fantastic. Okay. So then what we have going is that instead of here, we're going to compare it to our size. And that looks like that's everywhere we use that size. So we'll save it again and we'll run it again. And now we can maybe print uh, some magic. Biggest size, let's do 10. <gasps> Amazing. Okay, I know someone's going to say 100. I know it. I know it. So I'm going to preempt it and I'm going to print you a pyramid with 100. And it's going to be horrible. It's going to be horrible. So there you go. That's a pyramid with a 100. Um, so that is really solving these types of questions, um, which I think is really uh, very, it's very good to be able to problem solve them and to really think through how you can, you know, how you can approach these types of problems. And once you get it working, you know, it's just, it really does. The satisfaction level is like just, 
you know, it's like a mood, okay? When you've got something working, amazing. So I think that assignments are super fun. Um, and I think because it gives you a chance, like it's not, they're not easy, obviously, but it gives you a chance to really try different things and, and, and play around. And that's what I was saying as well, you know, take these pieces of code that we've done in the lectures, you know, copy them into your own files and play around with them. You know, swap things out, do things differently, see what kind of mistakes happen, see what it looks like. Because a difference between someone who's new to programming and someone that has been doing programming for a really long time is usually the level of experience that they've seen a lot of different types of issues. So when they spot something, they know, oh, actually, I know exactly what that is um, and I know how to fix it because I've seen it a hundred times before. So, you know, actually enjoy making mistakes and seeing what it does. And I'm going to try and do that a little bit in lectures as well. So you guys get a chance to see, um, you know, what mistakes look like as well. Um, so, you know, we can try stopping it with different things and stuff. So if you have any feedback on the lecture today, um, please feel free to provide feedback. So I've been asking you for feedback and then I can change things as well. Um, actually, one more piece of feedback that we got in the last lecture was that um, sometimes the question that they posted in the live chat wasn't answered. So if that has happened, uh, your question has gotten lost in the scroll, please ask your question again and we will answer it. We will get through to all the questions. Um, so yeah, and uh, let me know if uh, whoever left the comment uh, about, um, you know, having the terminal and the gedit in the same window, whether it worked better today as well. I'd like to know um, if that has improved the experience. Yeah, so thank you, my thank you, Shrey, for being in the chat today. And happy birthday, Shrey. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And you guys as well, I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Enjoy um, your labs that you probably have coming up. Um, and enjoy the rest of week two. And uh, we'll see you in week three. We're going to have something really fun in week three happening. So, yeah, have fun. We'll see you next week. See you guys.